I'll start as we always do with the acknowledgement that the land we gather is the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Pane peoples who have a long-standing relationship to the land, water, and region of Southwest Ontario. The local First Nation communities of this area include Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, Muncie Delaware Nation, and Delaware Nation at Moravian Town. In the region, there are 11 First Nation communities and a growing indigenous urban population. We value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all of the original peoples of Turtle Island. I wanna thank everyone for arranging their schedules for this uh, special meeting. I'd like to get a motion to approve the agenda. So moved by Nancy. Is there a seconder? I'll second, yeah, I'll second it, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Michelle, I believe we need to call the roll to get approval. Marie Blosh? Yes. Alan Dale? Yes. Don Edmiston? I think some people are still muted. John? Yes. Anna Hopkins? Yes. Tony Jackson? Yes. Nancy Manning? Yes. Hugh McDermott? Thank you. Yeah, I didn't see him come in, Michelle. Oh, he, okay. So he is not here. Paul Mitchell? Yes. Uh, Anna Marie Murray sends her regrets. Uh, Brian Petrie? Yes. Jim Raffle? Yes. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schadenberg? Yes. Alex Westman? Yes. And Sandy Levin? Yes. Are there any declarations of conflicts of interest? Seeing none. Item three, Conservation Authority Act changes. Ian, would you like to introduce the report before I ask for a motion? Um, sure, Sandy. And uh, I will echo thank you very much, everyone, for uh, being able to meet the electronic meetings, I, I guess, are one positive change from the pandemic. It allows us to be a bit more nimble and deal with urgent issues like this, so that's good. Um, just by way of introduction and context, uh, I don't want to repeat what's in the report, but as you know, on November 5th, the, the budget produced um, to deal with the pandemic, but within that bill, as an omnibus bill, uh, were significant changes to the Conservation Authorities Act. Uh, there was no consultation with CAs regarding these changes. There was no warning that it would be included as part of the, the budget bill. And, you know, to be frank, that's, that's been a relatively consistent approach uh, with conservation authorities. So um, we've been scrambling a bit. Now, conservation authorities, as you know, were consulted last winter. There was a huge consultation session. I credit the province for that. But in discussions with my colleagues over the past week, um, the conclusion seems to be that the changes proposed in the act were not consistent with the feedback we heard at those consultation sessions. But there's been no public summary of what that consultation um, developed either. So. Uh, we're unclear. Now I have to give credit to Conservation Ontario, and I know questions come up periodically about Conservation Ontario's role, but they have uh, been outstanding in taking the lead on this issue, sorting through the legislation, consulting with all 36 conservation authorities to understand what the implications of these changes are. And honestly, that work took a lot of last week to figure out uh, what this means. 
Many of you, Conservation Ontario and some conservation authorities have aggressively pushed back against these changes. That's been in the media, lots of interviews, press releases. There's other authorities like us who are waiting for board endorsement of a formal position before responding. And to that end, I know there's probably more board meetings being hosted this week at one time than, than any other time. Time is of the essence. Um, as a budget bill, no public consultation is required. Second reading of the bill is expected this week and it's doubtful the bill will be referred to standing committee, although we don't know. Um, we're not overly optimistic there'll be any changes to the bill. Um, and you know, based on experience, we're not even convinced the opinion of conservation authorities carry a whole lot of weight. But despite that, all 36 authorities agreed we need to publicly and collectively state our concerns. So the report and the recommendations, each authority is presenting this same package to their board. Now, from my point of view, we believe municipalities do carry a lot of weight with the province. And that's why at least one of the recommendations is to try and engage municipalities. But frankly, we think there's things in the bill that municipalities may not support anyway. It, it does affect their abilities and kind of take away from some of the parts of their interactions with conservation authorities. But that'll be up to municipalities to decide. Our objectives to make sure they're informed and uh, encourage action. So that's the introduction, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, and I'll let you uh, introduce this on the floor. Good. Do I know I had uh, Ellen interested in moving the recommendation. So Ellen, would you do that formally? Yes, I'd be happy to rec move the recommendation. Is there a seconder? I'll second, Brian. Thank you. Uh, I'll open the floor to discussion. I'm looking for the little blue hands in the participant list. And I had her hand up. Sandy. Okay. Uh, go ahead. You're muted, Anna. Sorry about that. I forgot to unmute. Uh, couldn't find my hand as well. So thank you for recognizing me. I do have a number of questions and I really appreciate uh, this special meeting bringing uh, the concerns uh, to us because I do have some concerns about timelines here and what we're about to do. So um, Ian, I know um, just following up on uh, where we're at. So this did come through as a budget bill. It is going through second reading. It may, and we don't know if it's gonna to come to committee, but if it does, it would be at the end of this month, November 30th and um, the government is sitting on December the 10th, which is most likely where this will be passed, uh, given that it is a majority government. So I'm just trying to understand here how, um, given that this was a bill within the budget bill, I am concerned that a lot of municipalities may not even know about this and really haven't given it much, much attention. I could be wrong, um, but uh, as, as we bring forward this um, resolution to get supported, it's gotta go through, and I'm gonna just speak with the City of London process. And I know we have uh, one planning meeting coming at the end of November. And this could go through as an emergent motion to council coming up, but I'm just afraid that a lot of people do not understand what's going on here. So that's one of my concerns. The second concern is uh, regarding the uh, posting of the consultations that the province did, and they were quite thorough and, and went on for quite a while. They haven't been posted. So do we, so do we know if they will be posted or is it just going to be, this is going to be brought forward without the postings? And, and again, it's that lack of communication that's going out to municipalities 
so they can understand. Uh, I'm going to wear my AMO hat here so AMO can understand. I know AMO has come out uh, requesting clarification on the regs, on the regulations uh, as, as we move forward. So there's a lot of uncertainty uh, even within the sector that has sort of been following this. And I uh, just finishing off, uh, were any discussions had by staff, or maybe this is a discussion that we need to have here at this meeting uh, with Minister Yurik, uh, given that he is a local minister in the area, is, um, is that an opportunity given the timelines and not enough time to move things forward uh, important for uh, the board to consider. So I'm just gonna leave those comments and concerns and listening to everyone else's comments as well. So you, you're not looking for an answer to your two questions? Sure. <laughs> oh, Ian, uh, the two questions I heard from Councillor Hopkins was about any word about uh, ever getting the summary of the consultations and second was there any approach to or from minister york um okay through through the chair to anna uh sandy the third question i heard was, or comment was about municipalities may not know about this and that's our belief although um i believe yesterday and later this week webinars were being hosted by the province with municipalities to um, discuss these changes or answer questions. I have no idea how broadly circulated or well attended those are, but I have to recognize that the province has um, scheduled those two things. As far as the posting of the outcomes of the consultation sessions, uh, through Conservation Ontario, that question has been asked and we've received no answer. There's no plan at this point that we're aware of and certainly it's not linked in any way to uh, this bill or the passing of the bill. It's not a conditioner uh, of that. So that, that is a concern. And finally, uh, as far as reaching out to Minister Yurik, again, as Upper Thames, we have not reached out. I'm waiting to have this board meeting over with. And one of the recommendations is to communicate with the minister. Conservation Ontario has reached out to both Minister Yurik and Minister Yakubuski. Uh, for meetings, no, nothing scheduled, no um, positive outcome there. Conservation Ontario has dealt with ministerial staff, seen lots of questions and, you know, take this with a grain of salt. Our interpretation is uh, it appears staff uh, are having real difficulty answering a lot of questions about what we call unintended consequences of these changes. And the standard response, including at a webinar I was on with the province last week was, we'll take that back and consider it. And answers like, well, that wasn't the intent of the change. You know, it won't be used that way, more or less. So not much in the way of uh, clarity, Anna, as, as far as we're concerned. Okay. Thank you, Anna. Um, yeah, Anna. can I follow up with one more question? And I guess sure. um, just being a board member and my obligations and where they are and where <laughs> they should be, that's very unclear to me right now too. And so uh, moving forward, how will we know where to go here or is... Uh, <laughs> I think that's something for the future, Anna. I think there's still a lot of uncertainty, so it's hard to even answer that question. I know, but I think it can be, I'm going to make that um, comment because I, I think as a board member, we should understand what our responsibilities are as we make decisions on this board. So uh, that's just my personal concern that I have here. Okay, I've got a speaker. Um, sorry, Ian, did you want to reply to that? Sorry to the chair. Just, I want to go back to one of Anna's earlier questions. I, I forgot to clarify. The question was whether or not we've communicated with either Minister uh, Yurik or Minister Yakubuski. In fact, the on a conference call yesterday, 
about this, there was a reminder that this bill is actually through Minister Phillips. Um, this is a budget bill. He owns the bill, uh, including these contents. So in fact, um, that might even be a revision to one of the recommendations is we have to include Minister Phillips as the lead in any correspondence and copy Yurik and Yakabuski. So just. I, I think that is really important. And I am looking forward to hearing everyone else's comments, but reaching out to the ministers is something I think we should um, consider. Okay, Brian. Brian, I'm recognizing your hand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah. Uh, I think I support the recommendations 100%. Uh, I think we need to educate the municipalities. I know I've, I've brought my municipality up to date on the changes, and there was some shock faces in the room for that one. Um, I'll certainly put in the recommendation forward uh, that the, the board's providing. Um, I'd be willing to be part of a delegation to uh, Oxford County Council to notify them. I think... <sighs> Obviously, we, I, my opinion, this is just my opinion, is that there, the consultations were for show because obviously nothing came out of the consultations that was meant, that is in this, in this bill. And they didn't consult any of these changes back to the conservation authorities or ask for the opinion on how it would affect operations. I think the municipalities should be extremely offended at their ability to, they provide the majority of the funding and yet they're getting told they can't choose who they want on the board to represent them. That's, that should be deeply offending to all municipalities. Um, the province provides very little funding and yet they want full control. The fact that everything can go to the LPAT is not gonna speed things up, it's gonna make it slower. And it's just turning the system into someone with money uh, that can bully the system in my opinion. So not good for conservation at all. Um, and so I will do everything I can uh, to ensure that the message is out there. I agree that we're probably not going to get anything changed at this point, but this is not a, this is a long-term battle on this one, I believe. I'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Uh, oh, sorry. I was going to ask if there was anybody who, was there any representatives that agreed with some of the, I, I, I want to hear an, a, an opinion on why it would be good just to have municipal councillors or change the rule changes that have been uh, implied. Uh, Brian, are you asking Ian to respond to that? No, if anybody has a different opinion than my own, I'd like to hear, I'd certainly like to hear that. Okay. Uh, Tony, I saw your hand earlier. Did you uh, still want to speak or? Yeah, sure, Mr. Chair. I had a Please. couple comments and questions. So a, uh, after going through the summary, I guess, the alarm bells go off for me when we make statements uh, that aren't quantifiable. So when we say could, your might, so on and so forth, it's hard to stand on those words. And I know it's difficult to have any quantitative or qualitative data to support those comments, but in my line of work, certainly numbers speak louder than words. So I, I just voice that opinion. Um, in the component of the resolution, I guess. Um, there are a couple comments in the statement number one, that the province of Ontario work with conservation authorities to address their concerns by repealing or amending changes to the Conservation Authorities Act and Planning Act. I guess uh, my comment would be, there might be other solutions besides repealing and amending changes. So would that statement have the same effect um, by just simply saying that the province of Ontario work with conservation authorities to address their concerns, the Conservation Authorities Act and Planning Act um, by striking out by repealing and or amending no, change. I'll call, I'll call you back. So, so that was my first comment or question. Do we think that it might have the same effect or provide more latitude for different solutions um, in resolving concerns? And the next one um, that I, I have a question on is bullet point number four, that the province respect the current conservation authority and municipal relationships. I'm unclear as to what that means. Uh, 
what are the details that that statement would cover? Uh, how are we defining uh, the current Conservation Authority municipal relationships? Is that about membership? Is that about uh, non-mandatory programs? So on and so forth. So how do we define that statement or, or how is that statement applicable in and what's our interpretation of it and how would the province receive that statement? So, go ahead. Before I turn that over to uh, Ian, where where are you pulling this from? Is this from Conservation Ontario's uh, no, background? No, that's, that's, that's in the final document, which is the uh, proposed resolution for municipality. Okay, thank you. So bullet point number one and bullet point number four were the two that I was speaking to initially. I still have more, but... but uh, yeah, uh, did you, do you want, want to carry on or do you want a response, response to those? To okay. Ian, can you help? Sure. Um, so, Tony, your, your first comment is some of the concerns are, I, I guess, um, this happen, and, and I agree with that. And again, the discussions with Conservation Ontario and their follow up with the ministry was to get clarity around those things. You know, we presented that this legislative amendment could have this consequence. And we did not get any insurance one way or the other from comment always was, we'll take that back. We'll consider that and take that back. So our, you know, we're speculating kind of worst case scenarios in some of these cases, but the province isn't denying that that's the outcome. So we felt we were left with no choice without clarity is to raise these as and, and to push back against. Um, your comment, Tony, about uh, repealing the, the first bullet, where it's requesting that section six, six of uh, this amendment be repealed. That was discussed uh, fully yesterday at this Conservation Ontario call. And the that the province work with conservation authorities to address concerns. Um, we've in the two years with, with this government we have not had any kind of satisfactory discussion despite repeated attempts to work on you know improved timelines around permit uh, approvals better customers as early as last week the office their senior staff were unaware those initiatives were underway which is is difficult to believe so there was consensus that repealing this section was necessary to enable um, further discussions to happen. And then your last comment, bullet four, the, you, you kind of touched on this, the relationship between conservation authorities and municipalities. A lot of the legislative changes are about that relationship. And it's not just who can be a member on the board, I mean, but that has always been a municipal decision, not provincial. Uh, I think overall the municipality impose control have added that non-mandatory programs for which the province pays nothing. They said at first you could have an agreement with the municipality. Now they're saying those agreements will have to conform to provincial regulations, which aren't drafted. And any other work the Conservation Authority wants to do with other partners would have to confirm that undrafted. So again, it's speculation, it's fear, is the, the attempt to restrict the scope of our work, even for things the province doesn't pay for, which is most of, of what we do. And frankly, we have all kinds of examples of work with municipalities for local stewardship, local initiatives, seems to want to come in and, um, and yet not pay or, or have any skin in the game, frankly. So it is broad and you touched on some of it, but it, it just seems um, uh, very controlling and unnecessary for a system that's worked for decades. So I'll leave it there, Sandy. Tony, you still have the floor.
Tommy? Yeah. Sorry, I don't know whether Ian was fading out or whether it was my link here. Um, but hopefully... I think there was a bit of a delay in what he was saying, but... Okay, so I so, uh, appreciate that. I guess uh, from my perspective, I'm not against the uh, standards and requirements of practice um, because in many professional industries, be it doctors, lawyers, school boards, so on and so forth, they, they have to work to a certain standard or, or requirement. Um, so if they're reasonable and practical and make sense and satisfy the ends of the organization, I guess these are the unknowns. We don't, we don't know if they fit, but, uh, but I'm not against those standards and regulations if, if they suit the ends of the organization and our objectives as a board. But uh, again, there's the unknown, I guess. So, so I was a little uh, concerned about the wording there because it doesn't have a clear definition and I don't know what I'm supporting if it's not clear, just like we don't know if the bill as it's presented makes sense because it's not clear as well. The only other thing that I would say is in the recommendations on the front page. So we have three recommendations. The one that I struggle with a little bit is that the board direct staff share this information in the draft municipal resolution with member municipalities, encouraging their support and action. And why I, I think I, I personally struggle with that a little bit, I, do, I don't think in my mind, uh, the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority should be lobbying and soliciting um, this directly to the municipalities. But I think uh, the information flow should come from the representatives being us as municipal appointees and us as municipal representatives. So, so I would change that. Um, rather than having the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority staff to solicit the support, I think the information highway should be from the representatives back to the municipalities. In other words, this, this uh, information and resolution has been shared with the directors. And I think it's the director's responsibility to go back to their appropriate municipalities and share the information rather than have it come from staff. So I, I would either change the wording or strike number two out of the recommendation. That's my own personal thought. Are you making an amendment, Tony, or just uh, sharing an opinion? I'm sharing the opinion for discussion. I would be prepared to make an amendment, but I, I think it's fair for the board to have that discussion, whether that makes sense or not. Okay. I'm looking for other hands, Alan. I recognize you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just like to respond to, uh, to Tony's comment just now. Um, I think, you know, rather than having 15 people go out and try to contact a number of municipalities, I think for consistency, it's easier just to have one standard letter, one standard document. Um, you know, Conservation Authority staff have all the contacts. They can send out one email. It all gets there at the same time. Yes board members have a certain responsibility to take information back to remember municipalities, but it's a little more difficult um, when time is of the essence uh, to get the message back right away and get it there. We don't want one municipality getting it tomorrow and somebody getting it Friday and somebody getting it next Monday. Um, I'm sitting here right now, I've got a generator going. I've been without hydro for two days. My water pump just quit on me this morning. I got cows with no water. Um, I, I have responsibility as a board member, but I'm a little bit busy right now with some other things um, than to send off uh, an email to two different municipalities who have staff that aren't even there half the time because of an outbreak of COVID now in the township of Norwich. Um, 
So my personal thought is that we just stick with the recommendation, send the letter out to all the member municipalities. If the member municipalities don't like it, they don't have to act on it. They won't all agree with us, um, but let's just send it out uniformly at the same time, send the message out to the municipalities and they can do with it as they wish. Thank you. Got a speaker's list, Joe, then Brian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I totally agree with Alan. Uh, this should be done immediately. And by, by having it done in a piecemeal system is just going to make it hard to handle. I, I totally agree with Alan. And thank you, Brian. Yeah, I, I uh, agree with both of those gentlemen. I think consistency in the message is very important. And as a board, we vote on that message and then we uh, send that out to municipalities. And if they have questions, they can contact their uh, director for clarification and then have discussed it on themselves once they become informed of the situation. Uh, I will make a friendly amendment to number three that it be sent to Minister Phillips as the lead on that. Okay, is there a seconder for the amendment? Is there a seconder for the second amendment? That. It's Alan, I'll second that. Thank you. Uh, is there discussion on the amendment? Can I get uh, Michelle to call the roll on the amendment? Marie Bloch? Yes. Alan Dale? Yes. Don Edmonston? Yes. Anna Hopkins? Yes. Tony Jackson? Yes. Nancy Manning? Yes. Paul Mitchell? Yes. Brian Petrie? Yes. Jim Ruffle? Yes. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schadenberg? Yes. Alex Westman? Yes. And Sandy Levin? Yes. On the main motion, as amended, are there any speakers? Yes, Mr. Chair. If I just wanted to finish with after that. Sure. Thank you, Brian. I, I think this is where I'm confused as a board member and as a municipal councillor of if my municipal count the, the changes to the act, if I was a municipal councillor who a municipality didn't agree with that, would I have voted no or would I vote in the best case of the, the board? These are all questions that are, are very highly confusing when you get into something where you're on a board, but you have to vote in the view of somebody else. Um, and I think that's just one case right there where um, how do you put together a motion with one view and, and, and vote with another. I don't know how that works, but food for thought. Thank you. Uh, looking for hands. Uh, Paul, please. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, a question for Ian. And it has to do with timelines. Uh, we're asking for support from the municipalities, but in your opening comments, Ian, you said this is, this bill could be passed very quickly. Um, the earliest we could bring a motion before Zor Council would be two weeks away. So, and I would be fully willing to to bring that motion, and I'm and I anticipate that Zora would support it. Um, but if everything's done in two weeks, um, would that all be a moot point? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Paul. And I'm leaving my video off to see if the voice is better. You're absolutely right, Paul. And uh, I don't see any way around those kinds of logistics. I mean, even arranging this board meeting took some time. But I do think there's value, even if it's after the fact. We may not change the legislation, but we may affect pending regulations that come out of it. So. Um, I, I don't have much answer beyond that. We discussed it at Conservation Ontario. We still think there's value 
in municipalities and conservation authorities expressing concern, even if it's after the fact. So I'll leave it there, Sandy. Paul, you still have the floor. Yeah, th thank you, Aaron. That clarifies it, uh, even though it may be, uh, as you say, after the fact, I think it's worth the effort and, and I will be uh, pursuing it with Zora Council. Okay, thank you. I've got uh, Anna, then Alan. Yeah, thank you. And just following up, um, Paul's question was very similar to mine. Again, the timelines and um, where this information will finally land uh, with the provincial government may take a little bit of time, but I appreciate what uh, Ian has said, and I am prepared to, to bring this forward as well. I do want to go back to one of my first questions about an opportunity, uh, given that um, the last sitting is this or the, um, the passing of the bill will most likely take place December 10th. And um, so that's about a month off. Is there an opportunity or a conversation here to have, uh, to speak with uh, Minister Urich about the concerns that we are going to be expressing to our municipalities? Uh, you directing that to him? Sure. Uh, through the chair, sure. I mean, we, um, I think it's part of any letter that we would forward to Minister Phillips, Yakubuski, or Yurik, we would include in there a request for a meeting or a discussion to answer questions or further support the, the conversation. So I would certainly make that part of the part of the, um, the correspondence, but in that case, my assumption is the chair and or the vice chair would be uh, the, the signatories on those letters. Uh, just kind of speaking to, to Tony's concern, I think rather than coming from staff, it comes from the board and that uh, the chair and vice chair would be at those meetings if they could be arranged. So yes, supportive, Anna. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, Ellen. Alan, you're muted. Sorry, I thought I, can you hear me now? I thought I clicked to the yeah. part. Yeah, gotcha. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, through you to Ian, um, have we heard anything, Ian, from Conservation Ontario about when the regulations will be dealt with? Uh, so much of this is up to interpretation. And until we see those regulations, we really don't know what they're gonna do. Um, have we have any idea when that's gonna, take place? Uh, through the chair to Alan, the only, uh, it's not even clear direction, almost rumor from ministerial staff is that within the next two weeks, they expect there to be a draft regulation that defines mandatory programs or core programs. So that would be posted to the environmental registry for comment. And by posting the mandatory programs, then you automatically can default that everything else is, is non-mandatory. But that's the only um, insight we've had to any of the proposed regulations. So if I could just follow up then, the, the other regulations regarding, um, you know, board membership and things like that might come later. Uh, it's just gonna kind of come and in, in dribs and drabs, or we're not sure? Again, through the chair to Alan, I, that's my understanding. I, I think they will come in dribs and drabs. And almost to speak back to Paul's point about we may not affect with our timing and our, our ability for councils to respond, but the regulations, I, I don't expect any more to be released before Christmas. And I would say even um, some of the pushback uh, we had with uh, provincial staff around appointing members and that it, it caused them to, uh, they seem surprised at what we keep calling unintended consequences. So in fact, that, that may delay the regulations even a bit more as they give it a bit more thought or we're hopeful that's what happens. And ideally there'd be consultation, but we're not optimistic. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, looking through the list, I don't see any more hands. Whoops, sorry, Anna. Thank you for recognizing me again. I have, just have another question, just uh, reading through the, the resolution. And uh, again, looking at um, uh, the, uh, asking for the a longer transition time up to December 22. So for non-mandatory programs, I would like to have a little bit more clarification so I can explain this if asked. Do we know what the timelines are going to be and why have we picked December 2022 as well? Yeah, yeah through the chair. So Yes, part of the requirement would be a transition plan and the expectation right now seems to be the end of 2021. So financially, changes would come for the 2022 budget year. The pushback is coming from some of the larger conservation authorities who are required to have their budgets done in June of the year before. So frankly, if you're going to have this ready for the start of the 2022 budget year, then all the agreements would have had to have been negotiated with municipalities by this coming June. And we don't even have the regulations yet. So it's the opinion of a lot of CAs that timing's way too tight. And frankly, the municipalities may not have the ability to squeeze that level of negotiation in. And keep in mind for the upper Thames, we'd be negotiating 17 unique municipal agreements because we start our budget process in June as well. So there is, that's the reason to push it out a year. It seems like a long time, but in the scheduling of budgets, it's not. Thank Anna? you. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Are there any other speakers on the motion? I mean, motion as amended. Seeing none, Michelle, please call the roll. Mary Blosh? Yes. Alan Dale? Yes. Don Edmiston? Yes. Anna Hopkins? Yes. Tony Jackson? Tony, you're muted. Tony? I hit his ass on mute button a couple times, but I'm not getting anything. Uh, I'll come I'll come back to Tony at the end. Uh, Nancy Manning? Yes. Paul Mitchell? Yes. Jim Raffle? Yes. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schadenberg? Yes. Alex Westman? Yes. Sandy Levin? Yes. Uh, Tony Jackson? Have we lost Tony? It appears we have. I don't see him on the participant list anymore, and there's nobody in the waiting room as I check now. Okay. Um, I believe, Mr. Chair, the um, the sorry, policy. I was never, sorry, I was never asked, Brian. Petrie. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian. Brian Petrie. Okay. I'm a yes. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I believe in the policy states that if uh, a member is disconnected during a vote, then their vote is um, qualified as an abstention. Okay. If I remember correctly. But uh, I believe the motion carries regardless. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. So the only other item of business we have is an adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved by Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, everybody, for making the time for this meeting and a good discussion. Stay Thank safe. You. you too. Yes. Thank you. Yep.
Bye, Thanks. everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.